Well, our pastor, uh, George Mason, and all of our current pastoral residents are in New York City today where they're concluding a conference, a workshop that they've been involved in with other uh, pastors and residents uh, from churches that have pastoral residencies as well. But within the theme of the residency, we're delighted to welcome back uh, to Wilshire today, Jason Edwards, who uh, was one of our pastoral residents who left us six and a half years ago yeah. to go to the Second Baptist Church of Liberty, Missouri. Now, here's an interesting exercise uh, for Jason's benefit I'd like to do. Uh, how many of you present today were not here at Wilshire six and a half years ago when Jason was here? Would you raise your hand? So here are new friends for you to meet. And uh, that's, a, that's a nice picture of the uh, inflow into the church. And uh, Jason, it seems like yesterday, for those of us who've been around, I told him it's like we stand still and the residents just keep moving their lives and move on. So those people have permission to sleep during the sermon, but nobody else. Or be enthralled. I will not... <laughs> I will not take it personally if the people who don't know me, yeah. but the others of you, <laughs> I'm watching. <laughs> so Jason is married to Christy, and they have uh, three children. Uh, Jackson was born here right before they left, and he's seven now. And uh, then Luke and then Nora is the uh, new, almost newborn. 20, 22 yeah. months. Yeah, moving yeah. along uh, there. And so Jason, we're so delighted you could come be with us today. Uh, one of the things My about job. the pastoral residency is that not only do residents learn from us, we learn from them. And there's a continuing dialogue that's going on here. One of the things that we picked up from Jason was uh, the, the idea behind our unified budget really came out of an inspiration we got from something Jason was doing at Second Baptist in Liberty. And this was a you called it something different, but you got there and discovered there was a particular need. Yeah, that's right. Tell us how that sort of played out and where did this come from? Well, as soon as, as I got there as pastor, you know, I was 31 years old. I'd never been a senior pastor before. And they had some work for me to do. And some of that work was, would you please help us retire a half a million dollars in debt that we have from this renovation we did during the interim? And so I was really excited about that. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> Fortunately, I had a good mentor, but we, we sat down together and talked about other things we needed to do and decided to do some things to service that debt, but to focus on mission and vision first. And then as I got further in, I realized, you know, this, this is a church that hasn't reflected much on stewardship in the years before I got there. And, and it's kind of a thrifty culture. And so I said to the committee that we were talking with, if you'll give me a little bit of latitude, I think we can approach uh, this in a way that will not only help us retire the debt, but will also radically change our culture so that we become a more generous people. Mm. And so we, we found a consultant and we began to talk with him about, is there any approach to this that we could take that could really be centered less on, let's hit this certain amount of money and more on discipleship, because we really want to create a culture change here. And so there was something that they'd been experimenting with that colleges and universities use, and it's called a one fund model, where you would take 24 months, uh, you would look at that, and you would look at your one time and recurring necessary expenses, and then you would look at one time and recurring optional expenses, we call them dreams. And we dream together as a community, what, what could we do if our current budgetary barriers were not, were not a problem. It really became a dreaming process, and, and our one fund that we called the Catalyst Fund was born, and it was over 24 months, about a million dollars higher than we would normally give over 24 months, and they pledged it. Wow, that's an amazing success story, and was really an inspiration to us in creating the unified budget here. What were some of the things that you were able to do with the one fund that you would not have done otherwise? Yeah, what, what, what some of the tangible things are, of course, we, we, increased, we increased our gift to our mission partners. Um, we um, were able to do, you know, they had, there were many properties kinds of things that had piled up over the years that they just didn't have the money to do, and we took care of all those things, so it was really bringing the house in order. But then we were able to build a school in Haiti uh, we were able to build a, work, on, work toward building a bunkhouse with a partnership in South Dakota that we had. Um, one of the big hooks that people really got excited about 
was we put out this vision called the SEND Initiative. And the SEND Initiative uh, was meant to help 200 people from our congregation over 24 months go to places where they would serve in places where they'd never been and in ways they may not have served before. And that was really more of a discipleship initiative because we all know that if you go on a mission trip, you usually come back and say, well, that meant more to me than it meant to the people I was serving. Or if you go to another country, it impacts your worldview. And so we thought, well, what would happen if we sent 200 of our people, which is really a large percentage of our congregation, out into places in the world to serve, they had that experience, that transformational experience, and then 200 people brought that back to the congregation. Um, and people got excited about that. So we subsidized people going on mission so that they could have that experience. So 200 people out of your congregation, I think you said that's about 40% of the congregation, right? Pro probably of, of the active congregation. Yeah, yes. that's a huge yeah. percentage. Yeah. And uh, how did that play out with them? Did it indeed change them? Yeah, you know, and it, it, they, they came back with stories of transformation and you know we all we're all different we have these different testimonials we offer and we we really tried in worship services and in publications to let those stories get out and of course we hear those in conversations but the but the bigger thing was they bring back new or renewed passion for ministry um, some of those things have found their way into our next catalyst plan uh, because because new partners are birthed out of those passions um, but it, it's really just amazing to watch people get excited, and, and they get excited not from hearing, but from doing. Right. So you're in the second iteration of this now, right? We just, uh, in fact, next Sunday, we'll have our midpoint emphasis on the, you know, it, it's just a magical name, Catalyst 2.0. Okay. So when you guys get to the Unified Budget 2.0, you'll know another thing has been borrowed. Okay, very good. <laughs> Look for that. I don't think George will let that happen. <laughs> so, uh, out of this process that you've been through, Jason, what are some things that you've learned about generosity? Well, two things that we suspected in the beginning and that we've seen to be true. One on a personal level is, of course, you've probably heard George say, Jesus talked about money as much as anything except for the kingdom of God. This was very important to Jesus, and I began to reflect on why. And if you just look at face value, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Which means, in many ways, our spending patterns are a barometer for our spiritual life, where our, where our priorities are. Now, we also know that when we take on new habits, uh, new findings in neuroscience tell us that when we take on new habits for a long period of time, it changes us. It changes the wiring in our brain. So what if, what if the habits in our life were that we were becoming more sacrificial, that we were not just reflecting our commitment to God and our spending, but we were spending differently and giving differently so that our relationship with God would change. So it has a personal transformational, and what we find, and I found this too, that when we give up things uh, that we normally thought we couldn't let go of, it changes our heart. So that, that's the first thing. And then, and then the second thing was um, what I always tell our people when we're dreaming about large things that seem impossible is everything that God needs to do what God wants us to do with us is right here in this community. All of the talents, all of the resources, all of the time, all of the money, it's right here. It's just that some of us are still holding on to the goods the means for doing those things. We're still holding on to our time, we're still holding on to our gifts, we're still holding on to our finances, and we actually are creating a barrier for God to do what God wants to do in this place. And, and so we find that as people engage in generosity, their lives change, but also the ministry of the church grows, and we see that impact as well. Now, that's a remarkable story. So just one last question about this, and. Is this something that just a few people made happen with large gifts, or uh, how has this permeated the life of your congregation? So the consultant we worked with did what a lot of people do in capital campaigns. They said, here's the gifts you need. And you guys have seen this before. We need this kind of gift, and this kind of gift, and this kind of gift. And we really approached budgetary stuff like that. And, and part of that is contingent on getting these huge top shelf gifts to meet your goal. Well, here's what happened to us we got almost none of the top shelf gifts and we met our goal. So 
So how did that happen? Well, what I, what I learned along the way through conversations with different people is that what happened was is that people who were in the lower end of the giving spectrum of the church or the median end just decided to start tithing. And so we might have had some people that were giving $3,000 and all of a sudden they're giving nine. Uh, and, and a lot of people did that. So we found that these, these mid-range gifts, all of a sudden they covered everything because people just started. And so what I found is there's this misnomer in our church that the church is being carried financially by a few wealthy people. And actually what I found is, is that some of the wealthy people that people think are carrying the church are not even coming close to doing that. But the ministry plan of the church is being carried mostly by very sacrificial middle class families. And, and, and so then what happens is this becomes incredibly sustainable because they changed their lives and their budgets around doing this. And, and so we thought, well, we didn't get this, but what we did get, we, we, can, we can carry this into the future. Yeah. Well, that's a wonderful testimony, and yeah. we're encouraged by yeah. that. Thank you for teaching us uh, all along the way, and we're glad you're here today, yeah. Jason. Thanks, Mark. Thanks.